are going to have uh, the luxury of, of having many more questions than in the previous session. So please, uh, we'll start from the left uh, this time around. So if there are any questions on the left, please raise your hand. Go to Yong Fu. Thank you, Pika. Thank you for your very enlightening presentation. And I think I wonder if you could uh, give more introduction about the Palestinian shift for, of the foreign aid. That's very interesting. You're talking about the foreign has been shifting from industrial foreign uh, forestry into something as a community. I wonder you could yeah, talk about talk a little bit more about that. Thank you. I mean, the world also has changed dramatically, of course, over this time. So the last 10 years we have, um, the last 20 years, the international trade has become uh, sort of uh, expanded very much. So initially, I think the industrial forestry was built in, was the, the idea was then more, more local that each nation should have an industry for their forests so they could provide themselves with lumber and, and pulp and paper domestically within, within the region or smaller regions. So that was ob obvious and, and this was a period when then sawmills were constructed with for, foreign aid and also some plantation forestry for industrial purposes. Was um, and then for different reasons, partly probably because the project sometimes failed. So this didn't live as an... Uh, uh, and then, then came this idea of local community development with more uh, approaching the idea of, of uh, um, addressing uh, poverty and, and social issues. So, so uh, and, and then, then in the 1980s we had the biodiversity boom. It was Ed, Ed Wilson and others who promoted the idea of uh, protecting biodiversity of the world and that went into the then uh, establishing nature reserves and this kind of projects. And then that again turned uh, sort of back toward more uh, the idea of more balancing social, economic and ecological ideas. And then now we, the latest phase is that we very strongly focus on the climate issue and the, the, the carbon issue and the red, the red plus, more like perhaps more like a financing instrument to the forestry projects. Not that that would be the only, and as the previous speaker spoke, we, we have been talking about co-benefits and so the idea of, uh, of uh, ad addressing poverty and rural development is certainly there but it's uh, sort of expressed as a, as a red. So this is broadly what comes out from, and uh, Parsons' book deals with all these previous phases, not so much, of course, it was written in 2003, so this red phase is uh, not included there. But that's broadly, and, and certainly one would perhaps hope that uh, the, the ideas are a bit more persistent, persistent. so, so 10 year shift in, in the ideas is not, not so easy to handle, especially with forests when you have forests in general are, are like a long, long, it's a long term idea. Any more questions? Yes, please. Perhaps I was not listening too well, but it has to do with the short-term solution of the five kilos of wood uh, that would be used, and instead you can do it for two kilos. So uh, wh how, how do you do that? The, the, a stone like this, which is underneath the pan here, uh, creates a flame, a hot flame very quickly with a small amount of wood. And these are available by different producers uh, the, uh, simply because now we have uh, uh, high quality steel that can hold, uh, 
hold the high flame. So having a, a simple stove, very simple thing underneath where you have the fire uh, can give you uh, the heat sufficient to cook your meal effectively with, with a very small amount of wood. It's amazing, in fact, how, how quickly you can get the pan to boil with, with this kind of device. And these are very affordable. I mean, one could think, why not, why not sending with the aid 100 million stoves like this into the rural areas, each feeding five people, so you, you'd feed, you'd, you'd make, make the meal for half a billion people. Uh, so much more efficiently than... This is currently done. It's, it's done, yes. That's okay. 100 million copies. Do you have 100 million? Uh, it's a scale. I may, you know better. Um, we can discuss. Yeah, we have a question on the back. Yeah, thanks. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Jahangir Amchadur from Bangladesh. Um, my question is that, okay, uh, is, it, is this stove going to be affordable to hardcore poor or uh, people belonging to the lower strata in the society? Because uh, Bangladesh has got a, like a problem in the sense that we don't have that much firewood. And uh, forest degradation, degradation is going on at a, rapid, at a high rate. So for a country like Bangladesh, these sort of stoves are very important and, and going to be very useful. The question is that whether is, going, is, is this stove going to be a affordable, an affordable one or not? Or do, do you need some sort of like subsidies uh, to, to give to poor people to buy these sort of stoves? That's the question. Thank you. When, when saying affordable, I relate it to the aid funding, uh, which is directed to forestry projects. So with aid, uh, with the current uh, scale of aid funding, uh, what fraction would you need to uh, uh, donate, if, if that's the right thing to do, or, or somehow r rent at a very low price, whatever mechanism would be. So uh, compared to what we spend in, in forestry aid and aid programs in general, then it's affordable. I believe that a rural person in Bangladesh cannot afford buying it from the market. Thank you, Fintap from WIDA. I, I, I mean, I, I can recognize a lot of sort of this description of the changing paradigms. I mean, I actually did work as a forestry economist for a year in the late 70s, and I was responsible for the Mozambican forestry plan in 1982. Now, there was a lot of focus then on industrial sort of development, so I think maybe there is some overlap in these paradigms, which is, is uh, actually important to, 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 to trace out as well. And, and what sort of motivates my question is that I was in uh, Mozambique uh, just, just about half a year ago, and uh, there was a uh, Finnish company uh, that then uh, essentially was trying to sell a forestry project, but not with aid which looked very much like the projects that were there uh, back in the late 70s. So I'm sort of wondering, has this sort of development of the aid and the aid paradigm, has that sort of happened and gone on in kind of a bubble? I mean, where you sort of have aid and forestry and there's been something going on out there. To which extent has this impacted on what forestry companies and so on and so forth do in general? In other words, has there been some sort of link from the aid mm. back to uh, the bigger business, back to the bigger mm. question? Um, or has this really just been kind of a sideshow? Thank you. <coughs> Certainly in many, many areas, like in Asia, the, the regular business dominates, the, and the aid is a minor, minor part of it, and, and it's mixed, I, I believe so. And as you say, you're certainly, uh, the, I um, exaggerated perhaps a little bit Parsons' message. I think he has uh, a more, more, more uh, as you say, overlapping view. Uh, then now, in forest business, what has happened in the last 10 years, it has globalized 
earlier, like the European companies and the Finnish forest companies served the European customers. And now, now the whole world has, uh, is global. So if you have a pulp, uh, if, if you have pulp available in a harbor, you can, you can send it anywhere in the world. It's fully global. And, and that affects uh, the, the market in the way that then it concentrates, the, bus the forestry business concentrates into certain areas where the economics are favorable. And, and that is certainly one. So certain areas develop very fast, others are forgotten. And, and a new, new, new phenomenon is bioenergy trade. And in that area also the private business is developing all over the world, where they perhaps could grow bio, uh, bioenergy crops and ship them also internationally uh, to, to remote distances. And that kind of projects, I think, I think um, are happening in the, uh, also mixed with the aid programs. So if there's no more question, I, I'm going to allow myself to ask a, a clarification question. So you talked about teaching the teacher and how important university were. We've heard uh, early on, uh, before the conference started, from Len Pritchett, a lot of skepticism on, on the role of training in development and the fact that there's really a lack of ownership from, uh, from countries. So how do you think teaching the teacher would, uh, would change that paradigm? Or do you, uh, how do you uh, uh, address the issue of ownership uh, in, in the context of your medium-term solution? Uh, I mean, this is the long-term solution that uh, the university uh, infrastructure, and that's very unbalanced in the world. And we see in the de developed areas and, and currently in Asia that universities, universities drive development and they and in, even locally within each country, uh, like the municipalities compete who can get the university and who can develop the university. So university is a key of de in development. And if you look at the map of universities in the, in the, in the world, so Africa is really very thin. Uh, the universities exist, but they are certainly not developed to the best possible way and that is something perhaps aid programs have not addressed in the past uh, taking a very long-term perspective it takes 25 years to build a university or maybe to, to put it uh, in so it's a very long-term <laughs> program but it's important thank you very much for this uh, again very insightful presentation please join me in uh, giving a round of applause